Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, while I wish that we could all be here together in person in Ferguson Hall on this gorgeous fall day here in Minnesota, um, thankfully, Zoom allows us to um, bring together alumni and supporters from all over the country. Um, and it's my hope that we can do more of these sorts of things in the future. Um, my name is Clayton Smith, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Development for the School of Music. Uh, so that means that I get paid for the privilege of spending time with the generous individuals who support our students and our programs. Um, and I also get to help arrange opportunities like this for you to stay connected with the School of Music. Um, so in a moment, I will hand things over to our faculty who are the stars of the show today. But I did want to um, first let you know how this is all gonna work. Um, so first you'll be hearing from Dr. Warfield, our brand new school music director. Um, he'll spend a few minutes um, telling you about his background and his vision for the school. Um, and then he'll have a brief conversation with each of our three new faculty members. Um, and after each of those conversations, we will spend a few minutes inviting your questions for individual faculty members. And then at the very end, um, we'll have time and open it up for questions for everybody. Um, and to keep things somewhat organized, I'm gonna ask that you first put your questions in the chat. So feel free to pop those in whenever you think of them. And then um, I will call on people individually to unmute yourselves and ask your question aloud. Um, so I think that's enough of me talking. I'm very excited to introduce you now um, to Patrick Warfield. And I won't read his uh, full academic bio as we sometimes do before lectures, but um, we'll just share a few bits of information by way of introduction. Um, so Patrick comes to us from the University of Maryland where he was serving as associate director for the School of Music and led a presidential level uh, campus-wide initiative called Arts for All. He is a native of Wisconsin, got his undergraduate degree in music education from Lawrence University, um, and then went on to get his graduate degrees in musicology from Indiana. So uh, with that, I think I will hand things over to you, Patrick. Thank you so much, Clayton, and really good afternoon, everybody. It's I'm so honored and so happy you were able to join us today. It's really great to see you. I, I recognize a few familiar faces and some familiar names, but there are plenty of people here who I have not yet gotten a chance to meet. So I'm going to actually see if I can manage to talk while I type and drop my email in the chat. Because if we don't get a chance to connect today, I really would love to, to meet each of you. So feel free to, to shoot me a note. We'll find a time to, to have a conversation about what, what excites you about the University of Minnesota and about the School of Music. So as you just heard, my name is Patrick Warfield. I joined the faculty here at the U on June 26th. So I guess that means I'm coming up on four months. So I still feel quite new to all of this and I'm, I'm learning as quickly as I can. As Clayton mentioned, I'm coming from the University of Maryland and I'm still learning to say, go Gophers instead of go Terps. Um, not yet entirely certain which of those creatures wins in a land battle, but I suppose we'll find out at some point. And at Maryland, as here, I'm a member of the musicology faculty. I study late 19th, and early 20th century American music, but I also served as associate dean for the arts at the University of Maryland and read a, led a program, as Clayton mentioned, called Arts for All. I expect that one of the reasons I was hired here actually was to help imagine what a similar campus-wide presidential arts initiative could look like at the University of Maryland. And I'll, I'll mention that the goals of Arts for All were really to to tie the arts to other disciplines on campus. And then really importantly to me, to think about how the community building, community sustaining and community transforming power of the arts could advance social justice in our region, our nation and our world. And those are all things that I think are even more important now to think about and things that we're thinking about here at the University of Minnesota. In that process, we created new degree programs in art technology, we created programs in art transformation and cultural transformation. Happy to discuss those with you if you'd like. But of course, what we're really here to do is talk about the exciting work happening at the University of Minnesota. So I came here for lots of reasons and some I will admit were outright personal. Uh, as Clayton mentioned, I grew up in Wisconsin. My wife is a native of North Dakota and we figured we'd meet here in the middle in Minnesota. Um, and of course, as one's parents get a bit older, it's nice to be closer to home and be able to take care of people. Um, 
Plus, I will admit, I have ever since of being a little kid loved the Twin Cities. Uh, coming here to go to the Walker Art Museum, Art Walker Art Center, to go to the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra in particular, were really important parts of my childhood and even more important parts of my wife's childhood. Her family, um, family of five living on a middle school band director's salary, used to make the four hour drive from Fargo to come see the SPCO, sometimes right here in the 10 man concert hall and then immediately turn around and make the four hour drive back. That was how they chose to spend their time and their money. And it was such an important part of growing up, an important part of who she became as a person. And the Twin Cities are an important part of who I became as a person. And so it's really a delight to get to live here full time. I also, in thinking about coming to the University of Minnesota, was really excited about the national reputation that Twin Cities and Minnesota has as a cultural and political center, a place where the arts really matter and a place where the social power of the arts are really celebrated. But perhaps most of all, I really honestly believe in the incredible potential of this school of music. There are not very many flagship state universities with comprehensive schools of music located in rich, culturally diverse urban settings. And I do believe that the arts and music in particular can help us build stronger urban communities. I believe that just as the School of Music at Indiana University, my alma mater, has become a sort of national leader in what a rural community engagement through music can look like, that our campus can become a national leader in what urban community engagement can look like. And as we extend out into the state, what suburban and rural engagement can also look like. And I'm eager to help us get to that space. But, and I'm just gonna be really honest with all of you today, like all schools of music, we face some pretty big challenges coming out of the pandemic. Remote musical instruction was tough, right? And I expect all of you know this, that because of that tiny lag in our internet connections, Zoom didn't work real well for making music together in real time. And so a lot of high school students chose different career paths as they considered college. The, the economic impact of the pandemic did the same thing. A lot of people were afraid, a lot of parents were afraid of having students go into music as a career. People weren't playing in bands, orchestras, and choirs at quite the same levels. And so our undergraduate enrollment numbers, like those of schools of music all across the country, declined. And they're still down. And the first order of business for this school of music is to rebuild those numbers, rebuild that important community of musicians that this nation needs. So you might wonder what that looks like. How are we going to do that? <laughs> well, I had the pleasure of addressing the faculty back at the start of the semester. And I explained that we really have three big tools at our disposal. One is we cannot be shy about our excellence. I've now had the opportunity to attend School of Music performances and Olton Recital Hall and Ted Mann Concert Hall. And I can say that the creativity of our faculty, the creativity of our students is second to none. But I think we've been a little shy about trumpeting that. And I refuse to be the best kept secret in the state of Minnesota. So to that end, we're starting a whole new strategic communications approach. We've launched a bi-weekly newsletter for our internal communities so that all of our faculty, staff, and students know what's happening here in the School of Music. And I'll just give you a few examples of that. A few weeks ago, we let the whole school know that we had the amazing Ashley Hall Tai, the uh, newly appointed trumpet player with the Canadian Brass on campus. She performed a recital, gave a master class and conducted a workshop on how students can transform their personal values into their musical goals. Just earlier this week, we had members of the Minnesota Opera on campus and our voice students gave mock auditions for them and got feedback in real time. And that's an incredible opportunity for students to get to work with professionals in the field at a major opera company. And I expect we'll hear more about this later today when I speak with uh, Professor Kim, but I think it's, it's it later this week that we're welcoming uh, Anthony McGill, the principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic. Some of you may remember him from uh, Barack Obama's first inauguration when he appeared on the, the steps of the Capitol building. And these things are not no longer secrets here. We're going to trumpet them as loudly as we possibly can. We'll then be taking highlights from some of those events, creating a newsletter probably by uh, by monthly to go out to our friends, our supporters, our alumni, and our donors. 
And then next spring, we're relaunching 2D Magazine, but reimagining it to tell our story even broader, even more powerfully. What are our faculty doing? What are our students doing? What are our alumni doing? How are we leading in this space? Our second big tool is, of course, our curriculum. Schools, of, and I don't know why balloons just went up in front of my face. Zoom does amazing things sometimes. <laughs> our second tool is our curriculum, right? Schools of music, which often perform the music of the past, can too easily get stuck in the past. And we're imagining our curriculum really from top to bottom. We've already implemented a new undergraduate music theory curriculum through which students learn both about Western tonal music and jazz theory and popular music theory. Our musicology faculty are reimagining the music history sequence, which already, by the way, begins with a course where students learn about music as part of culture rather than simply a product of culture. Next spring, we'll be launching a new class called the Entrepreneurial Musician, where students can get the career skills they need to succeed in what's becoming a very different marketplace for music. And next year, we'll be launching the Engaged Musician, a course to think about how students can learn to engage deeply with the communities around them. And I'll tease that uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be launching what I think is perhaps the most forward-looking tenure-track faculty search uh, in the nation. And there'll be more about that in the coming weeks. And finally, our third big tool is, of course, our community. The Twin Cities is a diverse, culturally vibrant, artistic space. I've spent the last few weeks meeting with the executive directors of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, the Minnesota Orchestra, the Minnesota Opera, the Cedar Cultural Center, the Walker Arts Center. I have meetings on the books, thanks to Clayton, with the Minnesota Public Radio, with Schmidt Music, with other cultural leaders in our, in our neighborhoods. We're forming partnerships that will allow us to more easily bring artists and scholars to campus. We're, but we also want to be in the service of our communities. So in the next week or two, we're going to be sending out an invitation to high school band leaders all across the state of Minnesota and in Western Wisconsin, letting them know that our faculty are available for master classes, for workshops, and that we're here to help serve them, to help generate and educate the next generation of music students in our public school system and our private school system, to be frank. We also have an exciting event uh, happening over the course of the next year. We're, we're inviting underserved uh, high school students to campus for workshops on what it means to go to a music school, what it means to take an audition, what it means to be an entrepreneur in music. All of this is to say, in short, the School of Music is open for business. We want to be a service to you and we want you to tell us how you can be a service to us. We look forward to forming partnerships all across our cities and all across our state. Now, with all of that said, many of you on this call know our faculty better than I do. You've been around this school longer than I, my you know, short four months, and you know many of our faculty, but I'm guessing you don't know the three faculty we've invited today, three of our newest assistant professors. Uh, Clayton and I invited these folks because I think they're doing some of the most exciting work in the school. And over the next few minutes, we're going to speak with assistant professor Song Yoo Kim, professor of clarinet, Savan Cohen Elias, assistant professor of composition, and Danny Gilbert, assistant professor of music education. And I will have a conversation with each of them and then invite you to join in that conversation moderated by Clayton. And we'll, I hope, have some time at the end as well. So I thought we would start, if it's okay, with Professor Kim. How are you doing there? Very good. Thank you for having me in. Uh, thank you for the great explanation and welcome to the school. Uh, art. Thanks. Thanks. We're so excited to have you, Patrick. It's such an honor to, to have you here as well. I'm going to give a, a quick introduction to our, I guess, newish assistant professor of clarinet. So Professor Kim is truly an international artist. I think I have all of this right. Born in South Korea, educated in Paris and in Los Angeles. He served as the guest principal clarinet with the Cleveland Orchestra, the London Philharmonic Orchestra, my old stomping grounds, the Baltimore Symphony. And he's now the principal clarinet of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. I have to admit, I'm a little bit in awe. My undergraduate degree was in clarinet, but I expect he's a, a little bit better than I am. <laughs> he's also a master chamber musician, regularly performing at the Marlboro Festival. And correct me if I'm wrong about this, Professor Kim, I think we can all hear you. 
October 27th, 28th, 29th in the uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor clarinet. Yes. Yeah, I'll be playing that one. Yes. That's fantastic. And I, I want to make certain everybody knows that the, let's see, the matinee on October 29th will take place in Ted Mann Concert Hall for Samuel Coleridge Taylor's clar clarinet quintet. So I hope, I hope you will all join us there. So welcome. I gave a, a very quick introduction, but I'd like to ask you, could you Tell us a little bit more. What, what does a day in the office look like for a professor of Claire? Uh, actually, the days in the office look like that. This is <laughs> a little blur. Uh, I was just uh, uh, teaching a couple of students this morning. And then uh, usually, uh, as, as Patrick uh, introduced me, I, I'm also serving as uh, principal clarinet in the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. And uh, we usually, our uh, schedule is Monday is off and Monday is my teaching day usually so I start about 8 or 9 a.m. until 5 30 5 6 p.m. and then also uh, we Tuesday to Thursday we have rehearsals and sometimes in the morning sometimes in the afternoon so depending on my schedule uh, we schedule with the students I have 16 students at the moment uh, including eight eight undergrad and eight graduate students uh, which is far more than I started in my very first year as uh, I think this is my third year uh, as teaching in the University of Minnesota my first year as assistant pro uh, professor uh, tenure position uh, my first two years was during pandemic so it wasn't <laughs> it was very uh, unusual <laughs> circumstances uh, but it was very good for me to absorb how how everything works and now that we're back to normal normal this it feels like since last year everything is going like boost uh boosting much better than COVID uh era can you can you talk a little bit more about that like do you wait for students to come to you do you go out and find them how does how do students know about you oh you mean uh the new students who come yeah. to the university? uh it's at the moment, it's more 80% of the students uh, who contact uh, us, the University of uh, Minnesota, and also uh, contact uh, personally uh, that they're willing to study with me or they're willing to uh, come to study at the University of Minnesota. Not just uh, the school is great and the faculties are, everything is so great, but also I think uh, uh, one of the great fact was uh, Minnesota Orchestra and St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, which has, it's very rare to have uh, huge uh, organizations of this musical performance uh, stage, which can uh, students can benefit very closely and then hear and also great faculties from those uh, uh, performance uh, er area at the moment. That's one of the things I think that probably everybody on this call knows, but we are really in a unique space where we can get faculty who are not former performers, but actually currently on stage at major major institutions. Could you talk a little bit, like you've, you've had this international career, you've lived all over the world, studied all over the world, played all over the world. What compels you to be in the Twin Cities and at the university? Uh, I guess how it attracted me was also by the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, which uh, since Patrick, you played, you played you're still actively clarinetist. We should play some duet together the next time. Uh, uh, it, I got this uh, uh, review from uh, about the Martin Frost, one of the interna biggest international clarinetists who was performing in the US and then he only comes to the Twin Cities to perform. Uh, it's very rare occasion for a clarinetist to see Martin Frost, and then he was artist partner with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra at that time, and then that drew me here. And then uh, once I settled down since 2018, uh, when this uh, opportunity opened for me, it was uh, like perfect opportunity since St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, they do some of the Baroque music also, which uh, gives me a little bit of freedom to uh, spend some time at the school. And which and also, as I as Patrick mentioned, next week, Anthony McGill, uh, New York Phil clarinet, uh, principal clarinet, I think he is uh, first African-American uh, principal woodwind uh, player from 
the major U.S. orchestra, and then he's coming to play with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. Then I contacted him to see if he will be available to give us a master class, and then everything worked out very, uh, very last minute, but it worked out very well. So I'm so excited to have him, uh, like to meet him, uh, to introduce everybody to him. So I'm very glad that's happening. Yeah, and that's that again is one of the things that's so exciting here. You know, the, the artists that come through to play with the, the uh, St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, the Minnesota Orchestra, the Opera Company, the Schubert Club, the Cedar Cultural Center, all of these artists coming through town is a, a fantastic opportunity for our students to meet the people who are the faces of music at this very moment. And are there other folks that you have brought or thinking about bringing? Uh, yes, we, we had a couple of, uh, during the pandemic and then also last year, uh, we had uh, Alex Federstein, who's a former University of Minnesota professor who is now head at the Peabody Institution. Uh, he gave us master class. And we'll have Ya, uh, principal of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, Yao Guangzai, who will be giving us another master class in, in a couple of weeks. And uh, since I, I studied in LA in, at Colburn School, and we have great alumni who's all, all over the, the states right now, uh, who recently got uh, appointed, was appointed as New York Philharmonic Orchestra's uh, associate principal clarinet, who's yeah. Ben Adler. And he will be, he actually gave us a master class last semester, and then students were just in love because by the time that I asked him, he didn't have that job. And then it was, <laughs> Like about two weeks after he, he won that of position, we were like, how did you win the job? <laughs> that was very interesting. And I should underscore something you said earlier about uh, Mr. McGill being the first African-American uh, mm -hmm. woodwind leader. The, the importance of representation in the school is, is something that we're really focusing on and making certain that students recognize that everyone can take part in the music we produce and the music we create. I want to ask you what might be a trickier question, and I'm I'm just kind of curious as to what you what you'll say. So you're a you're a clarinetist at a big public research institution. Could you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what you think of as research in the space of what you do? Uh, there there are so many uh, uh, resources that we can actually use at the school right now, and then there are so many uh, research that I would love to. Uh, dig in deeper uh, as as a clarinet uh, performer. We only use a French clarinet system, and then I was always into the German system or also Baroque clarinet systems. And then that's something that we really rarely see them, especially for the students. And I thought that's something that we can all all dig into the deeper, especially when we're in the U.S. It's really hard to get some resources from the European European system. So that's something I was always into it. And also not just it's a little bit too clarinet and nerd kind of things, but mouthpieces and reeds. It's all because of the climate change, especially in the Minnesota when it gets winter, it's very, very hard to maintain our our uh, level and that's something uh, students struggle so much also and then that's something that uh, students and I were always uh, trying different things and trying uh, trying to figure out what what makes it better to maintain our uh, level maintain our instrument and our read uh, kind of things and that's something that I would love to uh, do as a research and also uh, our, I feel like as a wind player our voicing is very important, and that's something that everybody. Uh, whenever I go to any other master class, not just the clarinets, it's we we talk about voicing. And I, the, the one of the my dream is that I collaborate with a uh, uh, medical school just to X-ray all my body like when I play some certain notes, certain uh, and how how it changes so that we uh, develop to give more input to the students that this is how it's working. So they might be much more helpful for them too. Wow, yeah, you said a lot of things that could be fascinating partnerships across campus, right? We could think about how do we connect with engineering as building right. read planning equipment or virtual reality to see what's going on inside your your throat and mouth as you make sounds with that piece of wood. That's a amazing creative thinking, thank you. <laughs> Can you um, talk about 
talk a little bit about what you think would make your work even more impactful. How could, what kinds of resources or structures could help you both as a, a professional clarinetist, but your students as they go out into the world? Honestly, when I first joined the University of Minnesota, I was very, I was just amazed of the research, the, uh, the equipment that they had, uh, especially in the hall, like Alton Recital Hall, you just put an email and then you can record it. And that's something that students are, it's never, I've never seen that before. And it was already there even before the pandemic era. And I think that's something that school did really wonderful job. And I think that's something that we can also put it in. If we can have more those kind of uh, resources, like uh, one of the faculty, a uh, woodwind faculty and I were talking about, oh, I really wish that we could record our lesson and then students can sh uh, like uh, keep it for themselves, email, and then also just take, uh, take back and re uh, re-listen to it and that's something that we often do but it's sometimes that as, as we said zoom or mic and those are not as good as uh the live and that was also always something that we talked about oh i wish we could have some resource that we can record in our studio or just in this in the le lesson room that students can benefit what's going on and they can go back at to their their home and then listen to it and then what's what can be better and then what was the, what was the professor saying that that they they pro they sometimes miss or how they sounded here something like that now that's really interesting so some of you may know that uh the alton recital hall has a just basically a button so if a student's giving a, a recital they go and hit the button and suddenly we're live streaming their performance but what what it might be like to have similar uh equipment in each of the faculty studios so that we could easily record what students were working on. That's a great idea. But again, uh, Alton Recital Hall's equipment is amazing. I really have to say that. Uh, you, oh, and I, I have to add this. Uh, SPCO, when when we come to play at the Tedman Concert Hall, I think that's one of the best hall in the Twin Cities, <laughs> for sure. And then we always uh, wish that we can record there uh, because it's, it's amazing. I'll say when I when I arrived here, everybody told me that Ted Mann was one of the best acoustical spaces in the in the cities. And then I heard my first concert in there and went, yep, that's that is a remarkable hall. <laughs> it is. And we're just about to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the opening of Ted Mann Concert Hall. So very excited about that. I just want to see if there were questions for Professor Kim while I have him in the hot seat. don't see any yet um so people keep thinking of your questions and we will definitely have um have them later have time later in the event well great well thank you so much uh saying you please stay on and i think we're going to try to bring you all together here at the end so i'd like to turn our attention over to professor savon cohen elias who's assistant professor of composition uh dr cohen elias is also very much an international artist coming to us from Israel. She studied in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, then moved to, I think, Vienna for postgraduate work, and then a PhD at, I don't know, some East Coast institution, I forget what it's called, uh, Harvard or, or something like that. She's lived in Stuttgart, was a composer in residence at the Chicago Academy for the Arts. She's taught at the University of Iowa. And she joins us as a composer, and that's too narrow a word for what you do, I think, Savan, a composer and interdisciplinary artist and performer who integrates all sorts of different art forms into big unified creations. She makes sound and sound sculptures and prepares instruments and choreography and texts and costumes. And it's kind of bewildering all of the things that you do. So let's start the same way we started with Professor Kim. Could you just tell us a little bit about what's a day in the office look like for you? What, what, how do you conduct your work and, and work with students? Yeah, so um, thank you, Patrick, for this introduction. Um, really, you filled a lot of uh, uh, directions in my work already. Uh, and I'm really, really excited to be here and uh, to share with you um, my experience uh, in my field and at the U. So um, I will actually 
talk about the two aspects in my work in the office. Um, so the one aspect, of course, is my composition. And as a composer, I and actually I was hired as a composition and uh, music technolo technology uh, emphasis. And I indeed uh, emphasize that kind of uh, aspect in, in my work and in students' work. Um, so the, the, the way that I compose is really um, um, creating some sort of three elements that I develop separately and also combine them all together. The elements are sound, technology, and imagination. And I all the time think about how can I create sounds and music that bring my imagination and realize it out uh, to the imagination of my audience. And um, I do that because I know that technology is a tool that is capable to help me to do this. Um, so what happens is sound is a form of energy and technology has the ability to store that data of energy and then process it and manipulate it in the way that I want it to manipulate. It can expand the sound, it can reduce the sound, it can turn it into something else. And this is where my imagination comes in. And um, this whole thing is uh, really essential in my work. And this is what I do all day long <laughs> in my office. <laughs> um, on top of that, as uh, Patrick mentioned, uh, I always kind of find uh, extra extra musical themes or topics that I want to communicate. And I then kind of attack it from many different angles and perspectives and put it in the center and then find ways to uh, plant associations and uh, emotional states that come from not just or not at all melodies, but uh, more like vibrations that are uh, connected to specific emotions that I feel that it makes that kind of emotion. Um, and with that, I um, I communicate uh, through that uh, my idea to the musician's imagination and then through that to the imagination of the audience. So all this uh, is really uh, important and it is important for me to also expose students to this kind of state of mind of creativity. And um, this is the way I design my courses. So other than uh, just keep teaching one-on-one -on -one composition, and this is basically just a different aspect of uh, my teaching. So in that aspect, I just listen. When I'm a composer, composition teacher, I listen to the student, I listen to their imagination, their goals, the styles that they want to uh, to use inside their music and then I just help them to to find a way to do that and elevate that and with that I expose them to other things that are happening in the world so they will have a better uh, kind of we call it like a bank of sounds bank of uh, ideas that um, even though they come with their own ideas, it's good to know what is happening around. And uh, my courses are designed in this way to expose them to that. So first of all, it will be a, a, some sort of a lecture portion in a course that 
that uh, will show both the history of this field and this field I mean experimentation with technology for the idea of creating music and and um, imagine and dream about things that don't exist yet and um, and that kind of field actually I show it not only in the history which history I mean it started towards the end of the 19th century where technology only just started to evolve and the telephone was started to have this kind of uh, competition between a few inventors and stuff like that. Um, but already composers started to imagine the future and to think what kind of sounds we will have in the future when technology is going to be like that. And now it's so exciting because we live in this world right now that, that those composers just imagined. And um, so we, we look at a lot of things that are happening right now and across many fields and many genres and how technology actually combines it all together. I, I love how excited you are about that. And I love the way you talk about imagination and dreaming. That's a really, really fantastic. Um, I'm going to tell you a secret. I don't think I've told you this. So when I first arrived here, I got my keys and I kind of poked around a little bit in some of the spaces. And I went into that electronic music studio and I saw a, uh, a wonderful theremin sitting there. And I was really thinking about, as you're speaking, the, the way that early electronic instrument, right? You, you kind of danced around a little bit. It's not all that different from the things that we have now. It's still transistors and <laughs> bits and bits and pieces, but you you get to actually make the things that theremin could only kind of dream of. Yes, yes, certainly. <laughs> uh, actually, today uh, the the nice thing is that technology likes to also reflect on itself and um, and bring back old technology, make it somewhat newer and make it more capable to do new things, but with what was very, uh, very interesting to do in the very beginning. So they, they managed to all the time bring it back. Uh, I mean, today people even collect now back tape recorders with tape cassettes. So they will have, it's, it's, many times all these tools are not only a means for listening to a music that was recorded but it's a means of becoming a musical instrument itself yeah what what was for uh just preserving music becomes an instrument in and of itself that's an amazing idea can you i think i probably know the answer to this but you know there are some composition teachers where students come in and they end up kind of sounding like that teacher do you're your students sound like you or do they go in other directions? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I really uh, think it's it's really hard to sound like me. <laughs> um, no, my, my idea, and this is the way I was also educated all these years um, when I was a student, uh, was to really find the special, unique voice that each has and brings and uh, and that's why listening is so important in my practice um, and I listen to what the student says I listen to what their music says to me and I make the connection between them because sometimes they need to kind of have assistance to understand the connection between what they wrote and who they are and what they want to bring to the world and how do they want to express themselves. And um, I think many of my students uh, also in previous years um, went to many, many, many different directions. And it's always a very uh, exciting to see what kind of directions they went and they only became better of what who they are and what they brought at the beginning. 
fantastic. And I, I see Maya has dropped a question in the chat. Maya is our amazing professor of guitar. And she's asking about how you do your, um, your collaborative work that involves technology, but also often live performers. And I was thinking about Professor Kim as well. And I've seen, uh, I've heard some of your music saying in Kim Gort, where there's uh, very traditional sounds and things I haven't heard come out of the clarinet before. Maybe there's an interesting partnership that can come here. Yeah, um, definitely. So uh, many times uh, in my collaborations, I check with uh, the musician um, several things. Uh, we check first what they like to play and how they like to play. And then uh, we check what I would like to challenge them with and uh, ex to, to, to find out more ex extended techniques, what we call, uh, that, um, that expand the, the, the kind of traditional sound of a specific instrument to sound a little bit different and to sound like a different instrument. How can you imitate that? And then at the same time, um, there is also the, if it's like real collaboration with the musician and the musician is going to premiere, nah, 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 then it's going to be also a, a personality thing. So uh, sometimes some musicians like to really uh, express their um, body performance uh, in specific ways or uh, their personality in some ways. And it works very well with things that I like to do with gestures and theater and puppetry. And uh, then I kind of bring it all together uh, to create my piece that many times will include also performance art. <laughs> Extraordinary. Can you um, talk a little bit about, I'm going to go back to my original question I promised I would ask you actually about why did you come to the University of Minnesota? Like what, what's exciting about this space? Yeah. So um, for me, the most exciting for me was the idea that I'm going to develop and kind of redevelop the whole part in the school that is the electronic music studio and the music technology because it had a gap of not having a professor for some time uh, in that field and in composition uh, in, in in that kind of composition mindset and uh, for me it was exciting that I can start uh, to develop this from scratch. Um, and I think it's related to the fact that I'm a composer and I love to think about ideas that are first like an abstract and then make them actually uh, come to life. <laughs> and uh, I love the idea that I have okay what are the tools that i have what are the parts that are here and how i connect between the parts how i expand it and how i develop it further and and for me that was the most exciting thing for me uh, to come here at the same time i also saw that there is a great reception of people that uh, when i came to give my uh, final kind of uh, interview I also met uh, many of my colleagues now, and I saw that there is a lot of reception of the ideas that I came up with. And I thought, okay, there is a room to work here. There, it, it will be good. And I saw that there is already a working electronic music studio, and we have an amazing technician there, uh, Michael um, Duffy. Uh, which is an amazing source or resource <laughs> that that accompanies my work and and really helps me to to do what I do. So that was my main 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 uh, part uh, why I want because I really didn't know the Twin Cities at all. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the only thing is that I knew uh, Chicago. I knew Iowa City, so I knew the Midwest, and I knew the weather, 
and I love the weather. Uh, I actually love the winter. <laughs> uh, what I love about it, I love the sound of winter and and that's enough for me. And the Twin Cities, when I came to visit, really impressed me in many, many different ways. And I knew that I will have a lot of inspiration here also and and places around the city to actually also contribute and also perform. I already have performed in the city in some places and I have some also big plans in the future, <laughs> so. Is there, I'll, I don't want to put you on the spot, but are there any chances to hear your work coming up? Well, um, in the collage concert, I will have a little spot. Uh, so I will perform a little bit of a, a dream electronic improvisation. Uh, so that that would be probably a first opportunity in the near coming. Oh, that's fantastic. And Clayton, correct me if I'm wrong, October 27th, is that right? I think you're yes, right. Yes, 27th. I'll put a link in the chat. Thank you. So the collage concert, I haven't gotten a chance to experience one yet. It's my first year here, but my understanding is quite a, a potpourri of things happening in the school, which I can't wait to experience. Yeah. So please join, join us uh, the evening. I think it's 7 or 7.30, October 27th in Ted Mann Concert Hall. Please come by. You can hear, hear a little bit of Savannah. That's very exciting. <laughs> um, so let's do the same final question. Are there things that would make your work easier? What kind of resources, structures would help you in teaching your students and doing your creative work? Yeah. So um, I think there are... Um, two main things that I keep like thinking about. Um, one direction is actually, even though we have a really nice and great community of, of faculty members that are bridging many types of uh, creative styles and, uh, and teaching, I think that another hiring of a composition professor with and with another electronic music or music technology expertise that are coming from, like that do a little bit different things than me because music technology is such a huge field that so many different directions can go i think this will create a, a better surface to actually start to think about a program of music technology uh, for undergrad students, for example. And um, with that, we want to also have uh, more facility that, uh, or to kind of re revamp or uh, how to say, uh, upgrade and update our facility that is already there, um, like the electronic music studio, which is uh, now in some sort of a talk uh, about how it can be even better. Um, we have really good uh, foundational uh, structure for the studio, but uh, since there were quite a few years since uh, it was um, kind of updated, we need to, to be up to date um both in hardware and software and the actual space uh, with that also finding new um alternative concert spaces that are more like a you know what we call black box that are more fitting this style of music of electroacoustic music that can bring all kinds of genres that make electroacoustic music and can be uh, heard through uh, some sort of surround uh, speakers and and uh, interesting acoustic elements beyond what we can do in in our really amazing concert halls uh, for acoustic music but when we add the electronic part it needs slightly different type of room <laughs> so you, you mentioned i can think three really important things there one one is to have a faculty cohort that can 
brings students a lot of different expertise in the kinds of work you're doing. A second is the recognition that any uh, music technology studio will be out of date almost instantly. And so they need to be constantly revised and revamped and updated all of the time. And that, that does take resources. And of course, one of the things I think about a lot, and I, I imagine this might resonate with your black box, is we have this amazing uh, theater arts and dance program right next door to us, a visual arts program, but not a shared collaborative space. And so what could it be like to build something in between that allowed students and faculty from different disciplines to come together and yeah. create the next thing? Yeah, that would be amazing. So let me just pause for a moment and see if there's any questions for Dr. Cohen Elias. Not seeing any oh. yet, so yeah, keep keep thinking of them. And uh, again, I, I put the note in there. If you don't want to read them out loud, you don't have to. Just uh, send me a direct message and I can read it instead. Well, next, last but certainly not least, our newest, our brand new assistant professor of music education, Danny Gilbert. Um, Danny joined us this fall, just as new as I am. So I'm very excited to welcome her. Let me make certain I get all this right. So. Originally from Virginia Beach, Dr. Gilbert earned her bachelor's degree in music education at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, a master's degree in saxophone performance. That's clarinet adjacent, so we'll round you up. Saxophone performance uh, and her PhD in music education, both from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She has taught elementary and intermediate band. And since turning to scholarship, she has published, well, she has published a lot. <laughs> articles about adapting music instruction for the 21st century, using technology to make music education accessible and equitable for all students, increasing student motivation in music education, preserving the health and mental wellness of students and educators, strengthening music teacher preparation. Her articles have appeared, you guys ready for this? Her articles have appeared in the Journal of Research and Music Education, the Journal of Music Teacher Education, the Music Educators Journal, the Journal of Music, Technology and Education, Research and Issues in Music Education, the Nebraska Music Educator, Teaching Music, Early Childhood Education Journal, and Arts Education Policy Review. And just a few weeks ago, she sent me a note saying her brand new book, Music Educators Wanted 10 Essential Qualifications for Success had been published by Kendall Hunt. And so you can go find that on, is it only online or is it hard copy as well? Yeah, I don't remember. Uh, it's available as an ebook. And um, that was one of the, one of the reasons we decided to do that was to make it more accessible for the students who might be purchasing it. So I can find a link and send it in the chat if anybody's interested. Let's, let's drop a link in the chat. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. So let's uh, let's just start the same way. What does a day in the office look like for a professor of music education? So my days are very varied, which I really like because no two days are different from each other, uh, which is quite a contrast from when I was teaching beginning in middle school band in the public schools. It seemed like every day was very structured, was very similar to to each other. But um, in my position as a music education professor, I'm a teacher, an author, a researcher, a musician, a presenter, and so all of my days um, are, are filled with a variety of different activities. So this semester, um, I'm teaching an undergraduate course of instrumental music methods, and this is a class that is geared for people who see themselves teaching band or orchestra. So it's um, it's a class to, to teach how to teach uh, if, in music education. And so that is about a, a two hour class on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And the way that that is structured is we spend about half of our time or one, one day a week in lecture based activities or opportunities for students to engage in peer lessons or peer teaching demonstrations. Uh, and then the other day of the week on Thursdays, we reserve for primarily going out into the schools and doing some practice teaching and observing and connecting with area music educators uh, in the Twin Cities and surrounding areas. And this is just such a really great place to be because within just a short drive, we have access to so many different types of schools and levels and settings and can really interact with a, a good variety of students and educators in the area. So I, I teach that undergraduate class, and then uh, my graduate class this semester is Introduction to Research in Arts Education, 
And that's a really fascinating opportunity for me to meet with um, just such a good variety of master's and doctoral students that are involved in uh, both music education and music therapy. And one of the things I'm excited about uh, working here with the graduate students is that there's uh, they come from such a a variety of different places. My my class this semester, I've got a student from Egypt, one from Taiwan, a couple from China, some that are local in the area. And so the discussions that we have are really, really rich and we get to learn a lot from each other. And uh, it's definitely an opportunity where I feel like I can learn as much from my students as I hope that they're learning from me. Um, so those are the classes that I teach. And when I'm not uh, in classes teaching, I'm working on thinking about how to improve teaching and learning and music education. And those, um, I feel like my research agenda is really uh, aligned with my teaching. So my teaching informs my research and gives me ideas about things to explore and to write about. Uh, and then, and on the other hand, my research informs my teaching. And so through exploring these uh, a variety of different topics, I feel like I then become a better teacher and then have uh, more ideas and strategies and um, thoughts to bring to the classroom and to share with students. And so um, I spend quite a bit of time thinking about that. And one of the things I also really love about being a music educator is that I still really try to actively saxophonist. And actually, uh, a few weeks ago, I was invited to perform with the Omaha Symphony. Uh, Stuart Copeland, the percussionist, the drummer for the police, uh, did some, they were arrangements for the orchestra, but he called them derangements, or it was the, the police deranged. And so uh, it was a really fun way to uh, to keep active and to keep performing um, and to explore some other uh, music that I can think about bringing back to the classroom. It's fantastic. Thank you. And you reminded us, I think, that for all three of you, what you do professionally shows up in the classroom and what you learn in the classroom goes back to what you do professionally, which I think is a, one of the great joys of being a university faculty member. We, we grow in our scholarship and in our teaching all the time with our students. So Danny, you've gotten to live all over the United States. How's, how did you get drawn here to the Twin Cities and why the University of Minnesota? You've said a little bit about this. But... Oh, yes. Um, I think the thing that excites me the most about the Twin Cities is access to people and ideas and how those are all interconnected. And I, I just think that the um, the, the rich variety of uh, different school settings and culture and musical opportunities and uh, professional opportunities that are here uh, are just endless. And I, I don't think um, I've even dipped my toe into the water, so to speak, as to all that is possible. Um, in terms of the, the relationships that we can build and um, the opportunities that we can have to, for our current students as well as prospective students out in the schools. So I think that was, yeah, the thing that drew me the most to this location in particular is just the, the, the vastness of opportunities. You'll have, uh, there's plenty of water to dip your toe into in this <laughs> land of many lakes. <laughs> Although you might want to do the dipping soon before it gets much colder. True. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask the same question I posed to, to Dr. or Professor Kim. The, you're a, a educator and a researcher at a big research university. How do you see your work fitting into the other things that happen on this campus? Yeah, I think um, the the thing that I am exploring quite a bit right now is um, the mental health and wellness, especially of our undergraduate students and of music educators in particular. And um, so that is something that I've explored in the past, but I have a plan to um, dig back into that uh, this year and, and really try to make sure that what we are offering our students um, is is best practice in music education and will set them up for success as future educators, but also that the um, the way that we deliver the curriculum and the design of the curriculum um, is fitting for developing the whole person. And so um, I, I like to start each of my, especially my undergraduate classes, but I, I think it's really important um, to spend the first couple of minutes of each class um, helping them develop 
what I call soft skills uh, rather than the hard skills of instrumental music education and, and what we need to do with that, but the soft skills in terms of helping to remind ourselves that we are people and humans and some things that they um, can can think about or just uh, reminders in terms of time management and stress management um, and um, our our theme of the day uh, last week was it's not crash and burn it's crash and learn and how can we take things that we might see as setbacks or even minor failures and turn them into something that is a learning opportunity and where we can keep growing um, and 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 keep doing what's best for ourselves as as people as we're going through this process so that's something that I'm really interested in and um, I'd like to uh, keep exploring more about how we can uh, keep our undergraduate students healthy and, and happy so that they go out into the field of music education and um, can enjoy a long career of, of teaching others. Um, I think unfortunately in the music education, all too often teachers experience burnout within the first few years of teaching, um, especially in, in today's times. It's, it's just a really hard time to be a teacher out in the schools. And so I think we have a responsibility in higher education to uh, prepare our students to face not only the um, the, the practical demands of the, the profession that they're in, but to make sure that they are taking care of themselves as people too. I love that. There's so much about music in particular and being a college student where, you know, I'm going to say failure, but I don't really mean failure. We're making mistakes and growing through those mistakes is what we do and, and coaching students through that process. And then hoping that they, when they go out in the world, they can continue that, right? Because new teachers are going to make mistakes in the classroom and need to figure out how to, how to recover from them and learn from them. And that's, and have that be a mental health positive rather than a negative. I just shared with my students the other day that my very first day of public school teaching, I had a couple of students lock themselves in a tuba locker. And I thought, well, if I'm done, there goes my career. They're not going to ask <laughs> me to come back. Um, but <laughs> but you recover and you learn from it. And now it has made for a, a funny story to tell in my classes for the rest of my career. <laughs> That's fantastic. So I know the work of a music education professor has a lot of kind of hidden components, things we don't normally think about. Like you, you have to build these relationships with the public schools. You have to go and meet teachers where they're at. You have to make certain students get placed. Can you talk a little bit about your relationships with practicing educators out in the state? Um, I was really fortunate that before I even officially started here at Minnesota, before I even got my email address for work, I was asked to go out and do a couple of professional development workshops for Minneapolis public schools. Um, I did one for the uh, elementary and middle school instrumental directors, and then one for the high school directors before their school year started. And so that was a really great way for me to start building connections and relationships with the uh, practicing music educators that, um, and, you know, those relationships I'll need because I'll need to send our students out to student teach and to gain some observations and experience with them. Um, I've also been asked to um, be the instrumental headliner at the upcoming Minnesota Music Educator Association Midwinter Convention in February. So I'm preparing three sessions for that event um, where I'll get to meet uh, other music educators, not only locally, but across the state as well. Um, and then beyond that, uh, a lot of what I do is involved with uh, being a guest conductor or a clinician or adjudicator. Um, a few weeks ago, I was invited to go out to my alma mater high school in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and serve as an adjudicator for their marching band competition that they had there. And so that was a really incredible experience and a, a great way to work with um, several high school bands and, and students that may now be thinking about a uh, college career at Minnesota. We'll see. <laughs> um, so I, th I think there's a lot of opportunities to um, bring music education from Minnesota to other places locally and, and nationally, and also to um, create opportunities here on campus to invite others to come and see all the wonderful things that our students and faculty are doing. And Dr. Gilbert hit on some really important points. You know, I'm, I'm very committed to the idea that the university can be an incubator for the next generation of Minnesota music educators. But we also want to make certain that our students are in great demand all across the country so that Minnesota has to compete for them just a little bit. We, we want to feed into the ecosystem here around us, but we also want to branch out into the world all around us. And I think that's probably true with, with all of you. 
So we've come to the kind of time of our actual formal part, although I see there's a question in the chat. Clayton, you want to help us out there? Sure. One of my uh, colleagues in CLA um, just asked a question. Um, I believe this is directed at the, the full group, um, and I have I have another one that's for the full group as well, but it's, please share some ways you engage with future teachers. Well, this is might just be for you then, Danny, uh, in the important topics that may be considered curriculum adjacent. What to do on the first day slash week of classes in your first job, parent community relationship management and building of their support, inventory and music library management, school music program advocacy, clearly a, a long list, arts relationships, unified front for the arts, uh, in their schools, successful recruitment practices, et cetera. There's only so much class time. Um, in my instrumental methods class, we have um, class sessions throughout the semester where we talk about administrative topics, or I, I kind of jokingly say, uh, these are all the ways that you, <laughs> that you need to make sure that you preserve your job. They're the non-musical things that we do related to budget and inventory and effective communication with stakeholders, with the parents and administrators you might encounter. Uh, and I think a really big one uh, right now is trips and travel in ways that we can maintain professionalism as music educators when we, especially when we're not at school and we're taking our students elsewhere. So I think that that is, um, those are all really important uh, topics that I, I have built into the curriculum. And I've got a lot of uh, practical advice and stories that I can share with students related to my own experience as a public school educator, um, as well as um, my experience in visiting area schools and working with um, student teachers for the last several years and the things that they come back with. But I think especially for first year teachers, a lot of the things that um, that they have to experience, they've there really isn't another place for them to uh, experience this in the typical curriculum, such as how to uh, request a bid when you're thinking about purchasing instruments for your school inventory. There's not really a, a, a place to learn about that necessarily in the music curriculum. So I try to make sure that that's incorporated in our methods classes because um, that those kinds of skills are just as important to being a teacher as uh, being able to do effective score study. Um, because if you can't manage the logistics of your program when you're out as a music educator, then uh, it won't be successful. I wonder, could we expand that a little bit out to our others? Savan, could you talk a little bit? Are there opportunities to help composers think about how do you get a commission? How do you sign a contract or, or singing? What are the, the parts of being a professional performer that students may not just get in a normal lesson to think about first gigs or management? Right. So um, I um, work in two different directions in that case, uh, at least at least that comes to my mind right now. Um, one is I actually bring, I kind of, try to bring and I eventually bring <laughs> um, players, professional players that are specifically um, specialized in contemporary music, in music uh, and technology um, and or use of uh, extended techniques, uh, that that can come to school and work with composition students um, and they can uh, create a piece for them and then they workshop it together then they uh, perform it and with that they get the opportunity that if the the performer likes the piece they will actually perform it elsewhere later on Another thing that I do, I bring different types, uh, different uh, composers from around the world that will talk sometimes through the Zoom, sometimes in person, it depends. Um, and they, they create some sort of an impact uh, about the information that they bring from where they come from and uh, the, the type of way of thinking about composition. And then, the main part is to expose the students to all the resources that exist um, on the media, on the internet, uh, that have like um, 
platforms where you find out call for scores, comp composition competitions, um, many different festivals uh, around the world that are um, bringing uh, emerging young composers to sometimes during summer and, and also so, uh, during winter sometimes there are festivals, especially in Europe, in fact, that uh, bring composers and create a group of just like workshopping with them and with a specific international um, ensemble that uh, that work with them. And uh, so it's really important that students will know about those opportunities, that it's not only about what you do now at the school with 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 um, whatever you have around you, but it's uh, there is a whole world around there that that actually is happening and there is a future for what they do. Uh, at the same time, we also bring uh, the connection to the students from the performance um, areas. And we created, um, basically the, the students created that from their own initiative, but I help them, I actually advise this ensemble. It's a, an ensemble, the new music ensemble. Um, that is formed by the musicians from the students musicians from the school amazing musicians and they are very excited to play new music uh, that they have never played before and um, so now we are collaborating in uh, several ways on the one hand uh, we create like a program that they perform music that already exists in the repertoire within the last 50 years um, but kind of already got recognition and um, at the same time we have specific concert every year that they workshop and then perform uh, music by composition students and now we got like really a lot of amazing stu students in the composition program in just this year. So last year uh, was the year that I arrived and there was one, one new composition student, uh, a grad student. And then we had a really big, nice uh, applicant um, lists that we managed to bring eight of them so we have really big now um studio which is not only these nine but there are a few more that still need to finish so it's it's a nice nice group including a few undergrad students that that want to study composition and and we work with them yeah. Great. Thank you. you. See what uh, energetic faculty can do to bring new students in. Thank you so much <laughs> for that. Sengun, do you have thoughts about how we can help students get all those other skills they need? Uh, for us, I guess it's when it comes to the audition competition and also uh, taking job auditions such as uh, university job as well. Uh, I have a couple students who has been uh, taking some orchestra audition that we do. Uh, we have one hour of studio class every week, and that's when we really uh, benefit uh, those students having get to play some mock audition and get some feedbacks from the students. And also, uh, when it comes to the university job, uh, we also uh, it's, it's a very similar thing as uh, Dr. Gilbert does in the in her classroom. Like we have peers uh, have one of the students uh, get lesson from like trial lesson from this uh, student who will be taking this job and then often when the things that they say to their colleagues are the things that they that I said to them. and also <laughs> that's that's what I say to myself oh that yeah I should yeah I should do this I should do this and it's always like circle by circle so uh it, it's very uh helpful for us to just uh, to give uh, my experience as performer and also teacher uh, what uh, like what you should do what should not do like at, for, for instance we had ensemble audition this earlier this semester I think that was the very first one uh, 
in live audition that they did at uh, Princess Forest uh, seniors undergrad student, which means all, for all three past years, they all always had uh, video auditions. And then they were so wow. excited to see them live audition finally. And it was very interesting to, to see them because they were also excited, but there was some sorts of uh, a lot of nervousness that we never see in their video recordings. So very interesting. So that's something that we, we try to uh, give more experience, uh, give more opportunity to students to go through. Thank you. And that, that goes back to some of the things I was mentioning at the beginning, right? This the whole pandemic situation changed the way students interact with music. And for just to think that why well, we have undergraduates who didn't get a chance to do live auditions for ensemble placement and playing in front of a live panel is a lot different than playing for a camera in your bedroom. <laughs> Clayton, did you say there was another question? Yeah. Yep, we had one other just general question of what are folks uh, excited about in the upcoming academic year, whether it's a performance to invite folks to or things that your um, your students are involved with that they might, um, might want to make folks aware of. You can chime in as well, Patrick. <laughs> Certainly. Danny, I saw you raise your hand there. Um, I am really looking forward to uh, next month. I get to travel to the Netherlands to present at a conference. Um, it's an international uh, conference on the scholarship of teaching and learning. And I'm sharing some work that I've done um, previously with student teachers where they um, are asked to go out into the schools while they're student teaching and conduct action research, which is um, or other, otherwise known as practitioner research. So they take a whole semester to define a problem or a topic that they see within the classrooms that they're assigned to or with the students that they teach, um, conduct some literature review, and then actually go out and collect data or information to see if they can improve teaching and learning situations in their own environment. So I asked my students to conduct action research, and then I conducted action research on their action research, and that's what I'm sharing at this conference. So I'm very interested in uh, the interconnections of teaching and, and research and excited to be able to share that. And um, I, I try at least once a semester, uh, pick a class where I... Um, I have students conduct a project where I give myself the same due, due dates that they have for their writing so that by the end of every semester, I have something that I can then send out to try to get published or to present at a conference. Um, and this will be my first um, international transatlantic trip. So if anybody has any tips about how I can sleep overnight on the airplane, I'm all open to whatever that might look like. <laughs> I have no tips on that. I don't know. <laughs> Savannah, anything you're looking forward to? Yeah, um, well, I look forward especially to next semester, although I'm also looking forward to the end of this semester because we will have our uh, sound art and multimedia class presenting their installations that I'm uh, really exciting to, excited to see what they are going to come up with. Um, next semester, I have some plans of uh, collaboration with Northrop. Northrop, I'm still practicing how to say <laughs> that. Um, and uh, we have this plan that is not confirmed yet, but it's, uh, it's going. And uh, the idea is to create a, a collaboration with the organ that uh, they got the new organ in the hall and have the students of uh, the electronic music uh, course uh, create compositions that will be for the organ and live electronics. And I think that would be uh, quite amazing if it comes through. Um, and at the same time, I am working now on a the release of my new album uh, that is a trio improvisers that we uh, all uh, created some sort of a world that is um, so sonically representing a melting world um, and I'm very very excited about the the, the outcome 
and what it's going to to do. Fantastic. And saying you something you're interested in or excited about this year? A uh, couple of events, including uh, next week's Anthony McGill Masterclass and also uh, Woodwind faculty will have Woodwind Day in November. Uh, that's happening since last year. We did it uh, over one day, giving masterclasses to high school students. So we usually just uh, send the flyers to the band directors and the uh, high school in, in the area in Minnesota. Then uh, last year, I think it was a huge success with uh, at the end of the, the day, uh, all faculty gets to play some recital all together, some chamber music and things. And I think that was went pretty well. So I think we're doing another year of those. Uh, I think it'll be more various uh, since we have more uh, faculty. And also some of the thoughts that we we're having is uh, maybe some of the students could also play in university students who can actually show how what they're doing and also that that'll be something interesting uh usually a clarinet studio have a uh, ensemble concert uh, in uh spring semester so i think that'll be also something it might be interesting and if, just for myself i'll be going back to korea a couple of times to perform uh mozart concerto this end of mid-December and then also in February. So that's something I'm looking forward to. Maybe you can give Danny some tips on sleeping on the plane. <laughs> uh, that's, there's no, there's no uh, good solution for that. <laughs> well, I will say I'm excited about so many things. Um, and I, I hope all of you have seen the energy and the incredible skills of these faculty. And I am just, so excited to work with them, so excited to help them do what they do even more robustly and even better. I see that as the main part of my job. I'm also endlessly excited to go visit parts of the Twin Cities and the state and learn about the arts that are happening all over our region. And I do want to make certain you all uh, think about at least coming to our collage concert. I will admit I had to miss one thing I'm very excited about. I had to miss the first orchestra concert because I too tried to remain active as a scholar and I had been away for a conference presenting some of my work when the first one happened. So I'm really looking forward to getting to hear my first wind ensemble concert and my first orchestra concert. And those dates are coming up quite soon. You'll find them. I put the link for the uh, School of Music's calendar in the chat. Please check it out. Please come join us. And again, absolutely shoot me an email. I'd love to host any of you at a performance here in Ferguson Hall or Ted Men Concert Hall. Clayton, anything else you want to say? Yeah, Patrick, uh, put the link for our um, upcoming events in the chat. I'll also, because um, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't include a link to make a gift if you feel um, inspired by what you've heard today. I'm also um, available to, to have conversations about different ways to support um, our students and faculty and uh, the great work you've been hearing about. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and if you know of folks who should have been here, um, I will be sending out the link to this recording to everyone who registered. Um, I invite you to forward that on to whomever you like. And yeah, we are um, excited for another exciting school year. So um, if there are any last minute uh, questions, I will. Um, I am allowing you now to unmute yourselves. Um, we've, we've got a few more minutes, I think, while folks are here. So. Um, but thank you again. Really appreciate your time. And to all of our um, our faculty who made time in your busy days um, to be here too, I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, so much. It's such a delight to see all of you. And I've dropped my email again in the chat. Please feel free to reach out. We look forward to seeing you soon.